Okay, so uh, we'll we sort of restrict what we discussed today uh, mostly to the simulations on the bacterial cell. And although we now have ongoing work on eukaryotic cells, HeLa cells, yeast cells, uh, I think Joe will show you how to build a yeast cell. Uh, but typically, uh, we try to input as much experimental data as possible. And you're sort of seeing that down here. It's supposed to be a petri dish full of bacteria. Coming in through the back here uh, is a bunch of experimental information. This is the case obtained from cryoelectron tomography. And this whole software runs on the GPUs. So that's what enables us to go to the time scales of several cell cycles. Right? Okay, um, and you know we all have to thank Amazon for providing us uh, the, the clouds for this. But the research that you'll see sort of highlights from uh, there comes from various places. So uh, uh, I'm also co-director of an NSF uh, Physics Frontier Center. It's called the Center for the Physics of Living Cells. Uh, the NIH, you all know, you're here as our guest, because one of the things we do is give out software uh, to help researchers. And But some of the other research, particularly applications, have been paid for by the DOE, the Keck Foundation. And as I said, we are extremely thankful to NCSA as well as NVIDIA for uh, really pushing this GPU technology. So, so far you've heard about three different levels of modeling, each of them good at different scales. So, at the beginning of the week you heard about the all-atom simulations, uh, molecular dynamics with the so-called NAMBI code. And, uh, as I said, those are very good. We're looking at problems from like uh, angstroms up to about 100 nanometers. Um, as you, uh, the main problem that we have there is it's one of uh, almost all methods. You have a, a sort of a yin and yang between the uh, size of the system and the time that you can simulate. So, and part of the reason is the inherent uh, time steps that are in these various programs. So with the NAMD, it's femtoseconds. Uh, if you want to do a more coarse grain, more rigid body simulation, I think Alex would introduce you to that, to the Brownian Dynamics Code. Uh, you can get little somewhat larger uh, time steps with that. But uh, where I uh, work most of the time is on the micron to the millimeter level. And therefore, we have to really change the description. It's a more probabilistic approach. You use a description called the Reaction Diffusion Master Equation. And everything we look at will be discretized into little voxels. Uh, and you'll talk about fusion probabilities, probability of a cell to be in a particular state. But what you really gain by doing this method is you can put in almost all the cellular networks that's in a bacterial cell. So there are thousands of reactions that you can include with this. And our time steps are microseconds. So this allows us to go easily up to hours, and several hours for uh, bacterial cells. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the reaction diffusion master equation. So I put in this one theory slide. So we are really talking about the probability of a particular cellular state. And the reason we're using this description, because within the cell, it's not like in your chemistry classes with an Erlenmeyer flask, we have moles of this and that. You may have one or maybe two DNA in there. You have a few messengers. Uh, you might have lots of metabolites, but that state of that cell is going to be described in terms of everything you want in your description. So the state of that cell can evolve in time through reactions. There are reactions that take you out of that state and reactions that bring you into that state. And that would be if the cell were completely well stirred. Yeah, but unfortunately, the cell actually looks like this. It's E. coli does. And this is from a tomogram that was provided uh, to us by Wolfgang Baumeister and Julio Ortiz. So you get the geometry of the cell from this. You see these um, sort of gray dots. Those are the ribosomes. You notice they're located more towards the poles along the sides. You also see where the DNA is. Uh, and then we were looking at a, a set of reactions called the lack genetic switch. So you have a gene going up, coming on. And when it's on, it makes these little red sears. And those are the messengers and they make uh, the membrane protein that allows more nutrients to come in. And those membrane proteins are the yellow that's in there. 
Cells are also extremely well packed. So uh, this can be a really challenging problem uh, to be handling. And so now to this reaction term, what we have to do is now put another identifier, uh, one for each of those voxels, that allow things to, to diffuse in and out of those voxels. But within each of those voxels, the reactions are taking place. Okay? So that's the whole scheme of this. And um, for those of you who are familiar with stochastic integrators, this is known when you do the reactions in the voxels or the, uh, the CME uh, chemical master equation, you're using the so-called Gillespie algorithm. All right, so if you're interested in the work that is going on, um, actually in the tutorial you'll see something that is even, I think, from 2009, the very first attempt is to put diffusion onto the GPU. But um, we're going to concentrate mostly on the things that are sort of down in this category, uh, ribosome biogenesis, um, and uh, at least in the talk and the tutorials will have sort of a little sampling of projects from these uh, other areas, because each of them uh, required that we build in a new uh, feature into the, into the program to allow us to simulate. But I do want to point out it's built on GPUs from the ground up. It's 300 times faster than other codes. And because of that, we can do these hour-long <coughs> simulations with molecular uh, crowding. OK, so let's talk a little bit about that crowding. So this is the tomogram that we would get from Wolfgang. And I don't know if the resolution here is good enough, but you can see there are dots all around the outside. A lot of dots here. But you can see you're getting the geometry, not the full cell here, but a large part of it. And then if you go now and just look at the ribosomes, and I tilt it back and forth, you can see, as I said before, they're located at the end and along the sides. Now you're going to come in <clears throat> and pack the cell using proteomics data. And for all the model organisms, they have been married. Proteomics data is available under various conditions, so that's not a major problem. And now what you're going to see in one of the uh, Jupyter notebooks this afternoon, uh, uh, Joe Peterson, uh, he's constructed a cell builder, and he will just go through this process. He'll take the cryo-EM data, you'll see the ribosomes, you'll pack the cell, and then you can bring it over and visualize it in VMD, because trying to look at these things in the notebooks, it's okay, but you never get the full quality that you get with going into VMD. Okay, so, uh, so that's the pack cell, and it's wobbling, and now we'll go on. And just to give you a feel of um, uh, what you're going to see with VMD, this is a little uh, plug-in that's been written. Uh, so we've packed already uh, a cell with lots of ribosomes. This is a fast-growing cell, so there's no, it's more or less randomly placed. We just wanted to show what would happen. And then we put in, whoop, oh, I forgot that does the wrong thing here. Sorry. I don't want to look at the state. I'm stuck. I'm going to do it this way. Um, so the ribosomes are the biggest uh, uh, objects there. They're about 11% uh, of the particles that are in there. And then we lumped all the other proteins into two classes, green and greener, depending how, how big they were. So uh, to get a feel for uh, what the program is doing, so it looks pretty packed. But now we're coarse graded, and we'll say, well, is that voxel half full or half empty? Uh, if it is, color it in. Then you can see the space that's left for watching the reaction that you're interested in. Now there's been an improvement. This is a this was a fairly old plugin. I think that, uh, and I, I understand from Mike they made it much easier for you to, uh, to use it now. But that's sort of, it looks like a, a cheese wafer, right? Once you do all the packing. Okay, so now to give you another feel, uh, what are the effects of crowding in the cell? How can that affect the kinetic parameters that go into my reactions? So what you're gonna see here was from a paper that was written by one of our uh, uh, computer scientist here, his name is Wenmei Wu, he had the first center of excellence for NVIDIA. And so again, I have the ribosomes and then the particles 
those two particle classes, green and greener. And in the middle, it's a little piece of DNA. And we have a repressor sitting on a gene, blocking it from making the messengers. Now we take them away, the repressor will come off. And because it's 3D, in principle, it can diffuse away and not return to it. But we found a, a simulation where it will return. And But you can see its motion is restricted by the packing of the things that are around it. Right? So you can do this, and you can do it as a function of the packing fraction, as you see upstairs on the, on the top there. And um, that, as you see, as you increase the packing, the probability of rebinding goes up. So even if you put in typical rate constants that are obtained, say, from biochemistry experiments, or maybe from a single molecule experiment, depending on the crowding, they're automatically going to be shifted because of the molecular crowding. All right, so the problem that we saw in that uh, theory slide was the so-called lack genetic uh, switch. Uh, it's well known among the biologists. So if you have like an E. coli cell, you've got the repressor sitting on the gene. Uh, if you have sugar come in here, like lactose or lactose analog, which is this IPTG that comes in, it'll bind to the repressor. It will then cause it to unbind from the gene, and now the gene can start expressing the messenger, and then it gets translated by the ribosomes, and then you make more of these transporters, these permeases, and you have more and more food coming in. So that's why it's called a switch. After a certain uh, number of those transporters, you suddenly switch on, and you go from having just a few of these membrane proteins to thousands of them. And all those reactions, there's only about 23 of them, uh, here, you could set up this model because it, uh, various steps had been measured. But we had a very simple picture for transcription, translation, and degradation, which has vastly improved with the time. But also, in setting up this model, we had noticed that you know there was even a mistake in the literature because people had often measured how many messengers in the cell. You can do that now with fish, single molecule fish, no problem. And then they also label the membrane proteins. And when it's switched on, it has 2,000. And a, typically, a bacterial cell or a, a gene will have maybe around 10 copies. So they divided 10 into 2,000 and said, oh, each uh, messenger is making 200 proteins. That's completely wrong. Because whenever you're doing these simulations, you have to look for what is the rate determining step here. So you typically have relatively fast decay for the messengers. But the decay time for the proteins, unless there's something um, in the cell that's killing it, uh, a pretty good estimate of its decay rate is the doubling time of the cell. Because you at least know when it doubles, you got half of what you had before. right? So people will kind of decay rate, dilution rate. So always check that. All right, so here is the, the experimental um, uh, results that we wanted to use to measure whether our model was working well, and that's when we also found out that that one rate constant had been set properly. Uh, these are experiments done in the lab of Sunny Shi at Harvard University. So uh, he labeled uh, the, the proteins, the transporters, and you'll see even the ones that look dark, if you blow them up, you'll see the basal state of them. So they're, you know, they're anywhere from about, say, 20 to 100 in the basal state of the cell. But once it starts turning on in about 30 to 40 minutes, then they turn into little yellow coffee beans. Right? So that was the metric that we wanted to use. And we ran each uh, bacteria got its own little GPU, just did lots of copies. And we wanted to get roughly one third of them turning on um, uh, in about an hour. So here you see the simulation. So starting off at zero, so we have them in various states. And now, uh, once they make the messenger, you'll see this lip of red. So the bottom cell is making, there now have been a lot of messengers being made. Um, and they'll, in turn, make more for the protein, which is yellow. And the protein will diffuse along the cell membrane. So the cell at the top, maybe that one over there. See the cell to the left and in the center don't seem to have very many uh, cases of uh, of the transcripts being made. 
So at the end, if you look at the two brightest ones, it's that cell over there and this one at the bottom. That one's still in the process of, of getting ready to transition. All right, so that was for a fast-growing cell. This is a slow-growing cell where we used more experimental data in setting up the uh, exact geometry. It's slightly longer cell than the fast-growing cells. And again, you can watch it and you can start looking at what's the difference between a fast-growing cell and a slow-growing cell. Well, you grow them in different media, that's for sure. But one of the differences up is the lifetime that that repressor spends on the, on the DNA operator. So under fast growing, you get a decay time of 730 seconds. Slow growing, it's 430. And you can also look at the localization of the messenger. So this is a distance along the, the cell. So the blue dots would be from the fast growing cell, and the red dots would be for the, which extends out about three angstroms, a little over three angstroms, is the, uh, for the uh, uh, slow growing cells. So you see, when you have this longer, but narrower cell, the localization uh, uh, from that gene onto the membrane is much smaller. Okay? You have the fatter cells, there are more searches that it can be making. And at the bottom movie, what we're showing you now, I've taken away the ribosomes, and you're seeing the yellow, which is the, the transporter, and you're seeing the gene turning off and on. But the other things that are marked blue and bluer are the uh, is the repressor with either one or two sugar phthalates. Uh, so you can also watch them where they move. And as I said, they're the uh, once in a while it'll come block that gene, so it can't make the, uh, the mRNA. And in general, you have of these repressors roughly of order ten of them in the cell. All right. So one of the things we wanted to do in those early simulations, we didn't allow the ribosomes to move. They were just blocking things, if you want. But now we really wanted to let them loose and start looking at problems like, how would you model, say, ribosome biogenesis? Starting with transcription, translation, assembly. Uh, how would you do that? And particularly on this campus, where we were at the time very lucky to have uh, one of the leading experts on the ribosome. And that was Carl Bowes, because he discovered the three, third domain of life, the archaea, and he did it by comparing the 16S rRNA. That's how they get these trees. Uh, they've gone on now to use not only the 16S, but some of the ribosomal proteins that are on it. And if they follow this pattern, then it's called the canonical pattern. But not every protein in a cell follows this pattern. But I guarantee you, for translation, they do. All right, so first we tried to use molecular dynamics and look at the assembly of that. Well, actually, first we looked with Carl, uh, what were the signatures of evolution of translation? And then we went on and did a simulation in PNES and then in Nature um, uh, on, um, on assembly, the early assembly, just looking at the folding of the first part of this. Because experimentally they could measure it and we could also simulate it. Then later on, we went and put a whole cell model into uh, our lattice microbes software. And again, we worked with uh, experimentalists there, Jamie Williamson, who's an expert on, uh, on uh, ribosome assembly. And I'll show you a little bit of details of that. So this is how we got the kinetic model for assembly. So this was done by my student, Tyler Ayers. There's Jamie Williamson. He's at Scripps. So they have known for years, decades, that the assembly of the ribosome is hierarchical, and that the proteins that have to bind first, the primary ones, the ones that come in and bind to them, secondary and then tertiary. So that was known actually since the uh, work of Nomura in 1974. So what Jamie did is he tested various parts of this assembly process. Maybe he put in all the primary proteins and then pulse chase experiments, then add in the secondary. And what do you get from that? Um, is this following picture. Uh, uh, you can figure out then the, the time it takes for each of those proteins to bind. So we took his experiments, uh, got a set of kinetic data from it, and then made this assembly map, which I'll show you here. So we're starting with the naked 16S rRNA, and 
we're adding proteins to it. So that's what's in those ovals. Shouldn't be an eye test for you. But uh, so you add, either add S4, or S8, 17, any of those primary proteins first. And the thickness of the lines there uh, reflect uh, uh, how many of the simulations actually go through this part, how many go this way. So it gives you a sense of what are the most populated paths of assembly. You also see this sort of a bottleneck region. And again, you can go in and use molecular dynamics to study that, which is something that we did in the biophysical journal. Why is that particular assembly of the small subunit with these proteins all bound to it, why is it so difficult? Uh, why is it so, only so few paths that connect from up here down to here where you have the intact 30S? All right, so that's all the work that went on before. Just to be able to get the kinetics into the model. And now uh, we can show you the reactions. There's 1,300 of them. We've just been talking about the assembly part. But we also have degradation of all the messengers. We also have transcription uh, of the messenger for the ribosomal proteins and the operon for the rRNA. So I think most of you know it comes in a big operon and has the 16S, the 23S, the 5S, and a few tRNAs are in there. Then we have translation, and, uh, and then everything can diffuse in there. And we were able to do this in 2015, or we started in 14, because uh, Johann Elf had measured, had labeled a lot of the ribosomes, small, large, and intact ribosome. So we have the diffusion coefficients for him that we can use. So here's the results that we got from that simulation. So we followed it uh, over 120 minutes. It was a slow-growing E. coli cell. You see these little blips here, the yellow? Those are those intermediates that you were seeing in that assembly map. There's never very many of them. So this is a log plot, and you see it going from about 3,000 to 6,000 ribosomes. Right? And if you want to see a little movie of this, then, oh, I forgot to put that picture here. It's supposed to be a picture of the circular DNA uh, is telling you that there are six copies, or actually seven copies of the rRNA operon there, which you'll see them in the next picture. So here's the movie. That's the setup of our cell. And now you'll see the operons, they're in red for the rRNA, and you see that picture should have been on the previous slide. So let's get a messenger made from one of the uh, operons for ribosomal proteins. Of course, it can diffuse, as I said. That messenger should bind to the small subunit, and then that binds to the large subunit, and you get a Nobel Prize for the ribosome. Uh, and now that's a translating ribosome, and it can start making the proteins. Every time it makes a protein, it gets admitted. And then when it's through the end messenger, it falls apart. And now we started the first step of from the rRNA operon, we get the 16S. And the assembly process will now follow. So one after the other of those ribosomal proteins binds to the RNA, and it starts changing color until you get to this small subunit. All right, and then when you're done, you see that the ribosomes are partially excluded from the nucleoid region, right? All right, so that's how a typical cell goes. Actually, uh, this was a movie made with Blender, not with VMD, uh, because you can uh, stop and take snapshots of it more easily uh, with this Blender software, but it, it's a high, high learning curve uh, to be able to use it. Now, we were happy. Um, with the results. You know, in biology, they always say, oh, factor two is OK. Uh, but oh, my colleagues over in the Physics Frontier Center were beginning to label those uh, rRNA operons. And they knew that the cells often have not one copy from any one individual operon, say that this is the D1. Uh, but after a while, you have DNA replication, and you have two copies of it. So how do we take into account correcting for the gene copy number? Right? And as I said, we had ample proof <laughs> that there were two copies of that particular um, uh, operon. So not only did we see it there, but colleagues started to come to us with their single molecule fish experiments and say, hey, we can measure 
uh, the, uh, the, uh, the mRNA distribution. This is the mRNA associated with uh, the gene T, uh, PTSG, which is the main uh, glucose transporter in, in, uh, in E. coli. And so we said, sure, we can model that, you know, stochastically. Uh, and we tried using, you know, the simplest model. DNA makes messenger, messenger can decay. And we tried modeling this with this chemical master equation. But we could never really fit well the distribution. We never got its full width. It had more noise than what we were picking up through the fluctuations in our simulations. So we saw, too, you have to account for the fact that you have two genes during parts of the cell cycle. So if this is the time for the uh, doubling time for the cell, say that it looks like it's around seven minutes, and let's say that gene is sitting right about here, then after this time, you're going to have two copies of it. The messenger level will go from 10 up to 20. It will take a certain time for it to reach that state. But it was really clear that there's going to be fluctuations depending on which cell you look at. So how do you take that into account? Well, we weren't the first to notice this. People knew that there was a problem. So one of the uh, suggestions was, well, just take an average of this region and that region, right? And try to fit you know, the data better. In fact, that was tried. Uh, well, to back up and say, uh, first what we did is we allowed for the second copy uh, into our kinetic scheme. And then we solved this um, uh, chemical master equation. And in fact, in this particular case, you cannot normally solve those chemical master equations, particularly when you have lots of reactions. But this was small enough we could actually solve it analytically and get expressions for the mean and for the variance and for the noise that you would observe in the experiment. And one of the most interesting parts was that you notice that it's defined by where that gene is sitting on the circular DNA relative to the doubling time and the degradation rate of that messenger. Those are the key things that go in. And because we could solve this thing analytically, we could also use it to check the simulations. So now you're seeing the comparison. So here was some of the data that came from another group. This was Rob Phillips at Caltech. He fit his data with this double uh, hump distribution because he said, well, this gene is sitting maybe halfway through, so I should be able to fit it like this. Uh, and it's not bad, but it's not good either. Here's what you get with the analytical solution or the simulations. So what this means, in that particular way that I presented the gene expression, uh, is known as constitutive expression. So you don't have transcription factors coming in there and playing a role. And it, it roughly, I think it's, I don't remember the exact number, but I think there's something like 60% of all the genes who are expressed constitutively in E. coli. So you can really use this bodily to uh, better fit the kinetic parameters. And even in the case where it is regulated, like in the case of PTSG, uh, so the, all that means is instead of this simple picture, you have the DNA can go from an off and on state, and then when it's on, it makes the messenger. So to allow for that and fit the parameters that are involved in such modeling, uh, the work that we did and the simulations uh, can already accelerate the process of figuring out these rate constants. And now you're seeing sort of the, the fit that we have. This, the green, would be if you had it with a regulated model, and that obviously fits the data better than trying to fit it with a, a constitutive model, which is the red. So you can start getting really uh, close to what's going on in reality by doing a much better job. And these uh, uh, models, the stochastic simulations, if you have a small numbers game, you have to use them. Right? Or you won't get the fluctuations, you won't get the noise properties correct. You only, you know, if you just keep on doing differential equations, you're just going to be able to get the mean or averaging over a whole bunch of cells. And those are the people that are involved, so that's take hip hop and Jin Yi Fei, and she was the postdoc doing the work. She's now a professor up at the University of Chicago. And there's your TA, Joe Peterson, and John Cole. OK, so now let's go back to E. coli again. And uh, so now to Tom Kuhlman, 
not only had he labeled the ribosomal uh, RNA uh, operons, he also put uh, 14 different labels on the circular DNA. So he had 14 different strains. And what he could do is follow when did you go from having one copy to two copies. And he did that as a function of the length and the time. And we could use that information then to develop a model for DNA replication. So if the cell has divided, how long does it take before you start copying the DNA? How long does it take to copy? And then how long does it take for the cell divide after you made the second copy of the DNA? Those are known as the, the B and the C and the D periods. So we use that information, put it into the simulations, and now what you saw before, the cell will divide in two hours. So these are all the operons. You see them coming up here again. You see things flash in and out. Those are the various ribosomal intermediates. And after two hours, you have a dividing cell. Again, all the, the timings are uh, motivated by experiments. And uh, that's why uh, we even have special little packages. Well, I think I've shown you some more results. Uh, uh, this goes along with those simulations just to show you uh, where the uh, ribosome is ended up, uh, where do you find the intermediates. They're actually mostly in the interior of the cell being formed, and here are the proteins that are all over the cell. But as I was saying, uh, because we uh, rely so heavily on setting up our simulations, we're getting bringing in various kinds of experimental information we've written these Jupyter notebooks, sort of almost for every technique that's out here. So, like, how do you bring in the cryo-EM data, the fluorescence data, say, from Tom Kuhlman? Those are all written through Jupyter notebooks. And you'll have a chance to look at one of them uh, the, the, that Joe has written to sort of take in, start with cryo-EM data, and then pack it in with more uh, uh, proteomics data to build up sort of the cell or something just like this and then visualize it in DMP. And not only do we do, as I say, E. coli, we've also done yeast, and then large colonies of cells. And uh, just so that you get a feel for the performance, um, sometimes we're just lucky because they keep giving us better and better uh, GPUs. So when we first started off, like looking at the lack genetic switch, uh, I think that one's not even on here. Uh, but what you're seeing here is the GPU type and versus the time, the millisecond it takes per time step. Uh, so if you want to do an hour simulation, you can calculate uh, how many uh, time steps that you're going to have. And if we were going to do real time performance, like an hour on the computer for an hour of a bacteria, you'd have to be over here. We're far away over here, but it keeps getting better and better and better. Okay? So again, that's in part to the great the GPU technology, its improvements, but also in large part due to the programmer, particularly uh, Mike Halleck, who uh, along with uh, uh, John Stone and uh, Jim, whoops, Jim Phillips, uh, has a non-disclosure agreement with NVIDIA. So we're always finding out what's the newest GPU that's out there, what features does it have, and also enables us to communicate back to them, oh, we wish we had this. Or when you put multiple GPUs somewhere, hey, they don't all communicate well with each other. How can we improve that? So it's really important you know, to uh, be in good relationships with the manufacturers of your computers. All right, so what I've told you about um, so far is mostly uh, the top part of this picture. And what this picture is, is all the proteins that are in E. coli. So uh, this part up here had to do with uh, ribosomes, DNA, so genetic processing, was for the information processing. But there's a big, equally big blob down here uh, full of proteins that are involved in metabolism. So uh, what can we do on that floor by putting them all together? Well, if you stick with the model compounds, uh, organisms like E. coli, these metabolic maps that show uh, everything that the cell can take up, like 
glucose, oxygen, other sugars, and everything that it can secrete, like acetate, formate, succinate. These have been extremely well developed, not by us, but by Bernard Paulson and his co-workers. So uh, for the model compounds, these maps of metabolism uh, are so good that, as you'll see, we can use them to predict behavior, couple it with reaction diffusion, and it, that have been already experimentally uh, tested. So what we're going to look at is a whole colony of cells. And we're going to see sort of a, a, a change in metabolic behavior as you go through that colony. And so the experiment and simulations that we did was we put a single cell on uh, an arter full of M9 salts, trace metals, and this amount of glucose. And now these voxels are no longer like the 32 nanometers that you were seeing for the ribosome biogenesis problem, but they were more like of 10 microns. So that means each of those voxels contains several cells, many cells. In it. And what you're doing is you're looking at the diffusion of the metabolites uh, around these cells. Uh, that gives you an idea of the uptake, of, like say, of glucose or oxygen into the metabolic map. And this is just a, a little snippet of one of the maps. And the strength of the lines here means that part of the network is being used. So this one's really taking up glucose and going over to the TCA cycle and making CO2. So uh, you solve, you do the diffusion for many, many steps. Then you do a steady state flux analysis, what goes through here. And you also get out of that a growth rate. And that growth rate tells you, uh, should you be moving cells into the neighboring voxels or not? And then you go through the cycle again and again and again. Time steps are milliseconds, and you do this for about 30 to 40 hours. All right, so now you see a picture of that colony growing up to from a single cell to a billion cell colony. And you're starting to see that cooperativity, uh, divergent behavior in the cell colony. By that I mean the cells that are close to the food, well, they're still consuming glucose, but they're manufacturing acetate now in the Previous slide, they weren't. They were going to the route to TCA, CO2. But they're making acetate, and these cells, which see little glucose, are consuming the acetate. And you can do a study of the distribution of oxygen through the host system. Originally, everything is well oxygenated. With an increasing time, center of that E. coli colony becomes almost anoxic. It's almost devoid or has very, very little oxygen in it. You can also look at the glucose concentration, how it changes with time. And then you can do an experiment where you compare the rate of R growth of the diameter and the height with what you see experimentally. And these little wiggly lines just allow for uh, different parameters in the simulation. Do you want to have cells move into the neighboring voxels if they're, say, 50% filled or 60% filled or 80% filled, something like that? All right, but here is the definitive experiment. You put in a plasmid with the two colored reporters on it, one for that PTSG, the glucose utilization, up here, and one for uh, acetate utilization, which is the acetate coming in and out here. So uh, according to this picture, if you come along now and do a structured illumination, you should be seeing that the cells at the top will glow get green, and the ones near the arter, the food stuff, should go red, which they do. Oh, I think you can see this even back there. And this little thing on the side here is a side view, which looks exactly like this. So that's why I'm saying, if you stick with the model compounds, you can have a, a can, you can trust the metabolic maps, and you can make predictions. So. I think people didn't even realize this, that there's so much uh, metabolic diversity within a colony of cells. In fact, when we first submitted it, one person asked, why do you do it in 3D? Isn't 2D enough? And they go, well, not if you want to see this, it isn't, right? So uh, I think the, the state of the field is the information that we have, you can, can now design uh, and validate uh, your hypothesis. So where are we going? Uh, with this work? Well, we're now collaborating, or have been actually for two years, with the people at the Great Venture Institute. So they published last year in Science the minimum 
uh, cell, the, the genome for the minimal cell. So they took a, a mycoplasma mycoides and had knocked down, uh, I think, like almost 400 genes. So it's now 473 genes. A large portion of those are involved in the metabolic network. So we have modeled that. Um, and so sort of a schematic that you have there. The good news is the other networks that we've already looked at are almost identical to E. coli. So what we plan next is to put them all together in the lattice microbes and do a complete host cell simulation on this minimal cell. And using the techniques that Alec and Imad were telling you about NAMDI and our Brownian dynamics code, we predict one should be able to in about maybe four years. It really does depend on how quickly we can get the structures of the membrane proteins. Because this being a minimal genome, it does not make amino acids. You have to bring them all in. It has a very reduced uh, nucleotide synthesis. So you have to bring in some of the bases. Now, the membrane structures are not all known. And then the biggest challenge is this will entail a couple billion atoms simulation. And uh, Jim Phillips was just able to do a billion atom simulation in NAMDI uh, a couple months ago. But I always tell people, don't ask me for how long. I think it was a picosecond. And uh, we had hoped to be able to compare the molecular dynamics, the, the Brownian dynamics, and the lattice microbes simulations for microseconds, just to see what you gain or lose uh, in these various uh, simulation approaches. So that's the grand uh, goal. And now, uh, sort of transitioning to what we'll be able to show you for the, we might be able to do the minimal cell, at least lattice microbes in the next uh, next year's workshop. But uh, as I said, let me just summarize that, that it's really important to bring in as much experimental information as you can, single molecule data uh, for, from tracking, reaction kinetics from decades of biochemistry, uh, omics data about how many messengers, proteins are there. You put it in and build up a cell using this pile M, and then you set, run it off and run it on a, a GPU-based computer. And so we run our jobs at various places. You're going to run it as a single node on Amazon. <coughs> so we can't have you do the really taxing problems. Um, we also have over the Physics Frontier Center a serious scale uh, computer. And then, of course, we have uh, and we have Blue Waters here at NCSA. Um, and then you bring back the data and you analyze it. <clears throat> and just to give uh, a little bit of a feel for the workflow that's through there, uh, through the Lattice uh, Microbes tutorial, you can bring it in and as I, uh, you set up your simulation. And then you can ask if you're going to do uh, reaction diffusion master equation or are you going to do a chem uh, chemical master equation, the CME, this leads you through, define your geometries, run your system, and then process your data. And these are some of the other runs that I haven't had a chance to talk about that's in there. We also do a very set, simple set of reactions called the min oscillations that, uh, that take place to allow the cell, help with cell division. So I don't, you can't really tell it here, but you see it over in the data. If this is one pole and here's the other pole, uh, they're normally not binding to the interior surface of the cell in the midpoint, and then that's where the cell knows to divide. Right? So we have that exercise in there too. And we, this we won't have time to show you, but we have also worked on the metabolic map for yeast. We just submitted that. It's, it's still under re, uh, revision at the moment. And um, but we are able to uh, reproduce the growth rate that is observed experimentally, and more importantly, there are now some C13 experiments done that gave us what the fluxes are through the various parts of the network, and we can reproduce those as well. And going along with having information about the reactions in the network, it's important to get good geometries, and. Uh, from our colleagues at UCSD, they're providing us with tomograms 
of this cryo electron tomograms for yeast. So here's a top down view. Here's from the side, you can see the nuclear pores where the messengers come in and out. And here will be the ribosomes out here ready to translate the messenger. And you're looking down on the DNA that's there. You see a little bit of the uh, endoplasmal reticulum and the mitochondria. So <clears throat> it is this kind of information that is becoming available to us now. And last, uh, if, even when you don't have the tomogram data, you can set up your own cell. And that's also what you'll be seeing in the demonstration today. I think, if I'm not mistaken, you're also doing a yeast cell, right, Joe? <coughs> All right, so uh, as I said, sometimes it's nice just to set up your own system, even if you don't have complete uh, cryo-EM data uh, to help you. And it ends with Mickey Mouse missing here. Okay, so uh, I think that gives you a feel. These are all the people I was mentioning um, that are involved in, uh, with this endeavor. The people up at the top here were the ones providing us with the tomograms, and these are our experimental colleagues. And this is Tyler again, and these are people who work on E. coli, either F FDA, some of the analytical work, and uh, there's the Jimmy K again. So uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I think, uh, uh, and we can stop now, or I can tell you other stories. But, <laughs> right, so why don't we, we call it quits, OK? All right. So uh, I know this was a lot, but are there any questions about the, the procedures, what it does, what it cannot do? That's also a long lecture, what it cannot do. But, uh, no. I have a question. Uh -huh. So I don't really understand the guiding forces that allow, for example, the cell, stimulate the cell splitting. Like, how are you calculating like the different positions of the cells and allowing them to move? Does that make sense? Yeah. No, no, that's a really good question. Because there are several ways to do it. So let's go back up to that. First, let's talk about the experiment. Um, so there are a couple different ways you can think about doing this. We had a kinetic model that before for ribosome biogenesis. It just dealt with a static uh, cell. It didn't grow. Things just happened inside of it. You got more particles being made. But now, if you want to let the cell grow, you need some type of clock. What should make it grow, right? So what we did is we used this experimental information about when do you see, uh, they said there are 14 different genes that have been labeled here. We have 14 different strains. You watch each one of the strains and said, OK, a, a gene that's here at about 3 o'clock, one that's at, at say, 6 o'clock, uh, when do I see a second copy of that? And you watch all those different points, and then you can get an idea of how long you should be in the so-called B period, uh, in the replicating period, and then after you've made the second copy of the DNA, when does the cell really divide? Now, what do you do with that information? So initially, in maybe that B period, it's only growing very, very little, very slowly. So what you can do, you can move the boundaries. Now, we're assuming it's going to uh, divide in the center. We could put that min uh, that uh, information about the min oscillations in there, but that would even be more reactions to add. So we made the assumption that it's going to divide at the middle. But then we just use this as like another reaction to say, make the cell longer, make the cell longer. And you just keep moving it like this. Now, another way that you could think about doing it, uh, and we want to compare uh, uh, what you would get out of that. And as I said, as you start uh, pulling it, and you realize now here, you at around this time period, you just start seeing the change in the diameter. So we know that. So we tell our simulations, start moving some things that were so-called in the cell to either of the cis daughter cells and make some space available. Before, this was inside of the cell. Now that position is outside of the cell. So it, the program knows. The other way we're thinking about doing it, because now we have 
as soon as we get the, the kinetic model completed for metabolism, um, let's see if I can find this quickly. <clears throat> All right, in this metabolic map, uh, and if you haven't seen them, you wouldn't really know this, but that pentose pathway that's up at the top, uh, that leads to making of uh, DNA, RNA. If, if there's another shunt off, that goes off here, that leads to glycerol production and lipid production. So what you could do is use those fluxes to sort of compare uh, at each stage, what are they? And that will tell you how much of the effort of the cell should be put into the growth of the membrane. So we've been thinking about doing that and then actually comparing the two. The other one is really focus, uh, focuses completely on using the DNA as your clock. But we know that there's a period where maybe the DNA has doubled, but you still haven't uh, formed the two cells. But most likely, you will see that in the lipid uh, variation, so we can get a better idea about that. Right? But it, it's only been recent that you can start measuring anything on that pathway uh, that would help us. Somebody else have a question? Uh -huh. uh, how many can choose the, uh, the number of ribosome and the, uh, the number of polynomials uh, and also? How can choose the number of that stuff in our simulation? Um, in the simulation, um, all right. So from the cryoelectron tomography, as well as from the work of Sunny Shi, he labeled the ribosome. So we we knew for the slow growing uh, ribosomes, and particularly from the tomograms, we knew the cell geometry, its architecture. We knew the number, roughly three thousand. Uh, we knew that also from Sunny Shi. Now, fast-growing cells, I don't think I have that slide. Uh, Tom Kuhlman had measured the ribosomes for both slow and fast-growing cells. So for slow-growing cells, as I said, it varies from three to 6,000 when you have them in the cell division. Fast-growing cells can have up to 70 to 80,000 ribosomes. So um, both cases exist. Uh, they're harder to visualize. Uh, doing single molecule fish is really a good technique when you are under a couple thousand. You cannot really, it's just a big bright block if you have 70,000. <laughs> now how can you choose that in the simulation? Yeah. Um, you can just tell it you want to have that many. And, and, and Joe will demonstrate that uh, to you. When we did our first set of simulations on that lag genetic switch, we did both. And we had roughly from the proteomics data, remember I had green and greener and orange. Those were objects that you had at, you could tell it what to bring in. So like for the fast growing cells, we told them to bring in many more, maybe 30 or 40,000 at that time. The only thing that you should be cautious about when you run the code is you should always put the largest guys in first because packing things into a cell, uh, you know, we had to look, you can't put two objects on top of one another. So the packing algorithm, you know, it looks for violations. And so you want to start with the big guys first, then add the next class, the next class, the next class. Okay, does that sort of answer your question? Uh huh? I, I mean, uh, Mutations in cell simulations to see if they can adapt better to the environment. Well, with these kind, with this particular set of experiments where you uh, do a combination of reaction diffusion and uh, combine it with these uh, uh, metabolic <coughs> pathways, if you had, if you knocked out a gene and you knocked out a particular pathway, uh, that will affect some, the flux is somewhere here. Here you're seeing it taking up uh, glucose and, and uh, uh, secreting mostly, it looks like acetate. 
So that's what these metabolic maps were designed for. That's how people knew that they were right. They went in, they did mutations, they changed the environment on them. Um, you had to be able to recover the knockout studies. Does the cell live or die? Does it grow more slowly? So if you have that information, uh, you can do that. Right? Otherwise, with those other models, like that simple model, the lack genetic switch, you would just have to assume, well, that mutation uh, uh, just slows down one of the steps, and you have to change the rate constant. Right? OK? Yes? OK, during the cell tour, so inside the source, so, uh, because uh, the way that the forces go into these models, it's all based on these rate constants. If you think about it, that tells you whether, whether two things come together. And that's it's sort of buried down. You're not getting, like when you do a NAMD, simulation, oh, I can calculate the electrostatic interactions, I can calculate the van der Waals interactions. You have done that and turned that into a rate constant. So sometimes now, uh, the information that we use for the rates comes not only from decades of biochemistry, it's beginning to come from people who do molecular dynamics. Because they can tell you, well, we see this process, we can simulate it now. So uh, yes, it's very it's there, but it's not going to become so explicit as it is in the all atom simulations or uh, or the Brownian dynamic simulations. Right? So you really need the molecular dynamics to do the uh, mechanism part. Okay. What's it from this experiment? Do you have some idea from the experiment or? Um, yes, like as I said, I think our experiments on the colony preceded the experiments. In fact, I complained to my funding agency, uh, I, how do I get them validated, right? Because most people didn't think it was there, it was important, so they gave me money for an experimental postdoc and he went and worked in a colleague's lab and did the experiments, right? But this is becoming much more prevalent. So uh, uh, I also shared a student with uh, the head of the, uh, the department head of biochemistry here. And he had been measuring the docking of, uh, say, tRNA to the synthetase, sort of in the first step of translation that sets the genetic code. Uh, and he measured it. And he goes, why can't I calculate this? And I go, you can. So he did. And he went and he used this method. I don't know if you learned about it in your free energy sessions. In NAMDI, we have a, pro, uh, a module that you can set up different collected variables. And you can run a free energy code called metadynamics and well-tempered metadynamics. So he used it. And then he got practically the same answer we saw uh, experimentally. He tried to set it up much the same way, concentrations the same way. But uh, that also presents a problem. Because normally, you know, I always tell my students uh, when they're doing a simulation, if it agrees with the experiment, uh, check the experiment, right? And the same way, uh, if somebody's doing the experiment and agrees with the theory, you know, it's like, oh, check the calculation, right? And now you've got the same person doing both. So I just told him, just don't lie to yourself. That's all I care, right? But you're getting, you can really get very close to the real situations that goes on in the cell in terms of like the concentrations that you put there, the salts that you use. Uh, it's all becoming possible of, in each of those uh, different approaches to modeling cell processes. Right. Half the battle just knowing what they were. People were very lazy. Not lazy, but like typically, uh, if they wanted something to grow fast, they would just throw it into like yeast extract. Well, nobody knows what's in yeast extract. They didn't know until last year when somebody finally did a mass spec on it and would tell you what are the different components of yeast extract. So you also have to get 
your uh, experimentalists, your collaborators, also thinking more quantitative. You know, to use defined media that makes it easier for you to do any of those calculations. Any, any other questions? Okay. <laughs> no. So, um, are you guys also interested in simulating like cellular attachments? So, like, um, how if cell to cell, like if they can interact with one another, or like if seeing like flagella on a cell and seeing them move around or anything like that. No, okay. I I know that my my husband he had had several projects on uh, flagella motion. I've actually done an MD simulation, if I remember correctly. Okay. Um, so it, it can be done. Uh, in terms of cell-cell interactions, this is about as simple as it gets. Because all we do is, in, in the jargon of, you know, uh, of biophysicists, you call this a mean field approximation, uh, you just use a growth rate to tell you uh, what's the impact of these cells growing. It just pushes them into their neighboring cells, right? You, um, that's about it. Uh, but yes, no, uh, you can do simulations on it. It's it's pretty challenging because those are very long, the vanilla. And I think they just sort of did the motor part and then that looked at the vanilla motions. But there are colleagues who are doing experiments on them, um, using optical tweezers, putting it into different environments, showing you different food stuff. That's done over in the physics frontier center. Anything else? Uh huh. Yes, how can I don't know if it's a simulation. How can I control I mean, uh, the browser to prevent to bind to the operator side? Uh, okay. Uh, can, you, can you repeat that? Were you asking about the repressor binding to the operator? Yeah. How can I control? I mean, how you can control? Okay. Bring the simulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Uh, let's go back up and put that picture up here. So, as I said, kinetics tells you a lot about what's possible in the cell. So what you're asking about is, <clears throat> uh, here's the repressor. We have it written as a dimer. It's two, uh, excuse me, no, it's this, uh, it's this thing right here. That's the repressor. And if you look, it has two binding sites on it. So when the lactose analog comes in there, and they use um, like IPT or TMG because they don't want it to metabolize. They want it to stay around. Otherwise, like if you try to do a switch, say the galactose switch and yeast, it'll get metabolized as well. <clears throat> so what can happen? The sugar can come in there. And now you see down here, most of the binding sites, there are two little green wedges in it. So let's go back up and look at our connection, our, uh, our reactions here. So we have it binding to the operator. Then we have it like with one inducer or with two inducers. And those have different rates. Look, they're a factor of 100 apart. And then when it's totally, so uh, there are large differences here. And that will control the probability to be seeing it either bound to the operator, bound with one, or not bound. So you have the forward reactions this way. And you have the backward reactions in this direction. So you see it here and see it here as well. This is the simulation? Those rate constants, those, those reactions are being calculated in every step of that reaction mm -hmm. up through uh, equations like this. Uh, this is called a propensity, but that's where the rate constant goes in. Right? All right so it's, it's the rate constant, how much of that mm -hmm. stuff is in there. And so you have a, a large probability, once you have two sugars on there, oh, uh, it's going to fall off. And it's, so that's why they say the gene switches on, and it can start making little bursts of messengers, right? But it's all through these kinetic equations. So getting these reactions is very important getting those. But that's a lot of what you get from biochemistry. People have studied these enzymes. People have studied uh, protein-DNA interactions, protein 
uh, RNA interaction. So the binding of the ribosomal proteins to the 16S, oh my goodness, it's essentially uh, irreversible. They bind at such higher rate that the back reaction is minimal. You can forget about it. Okay. It's all designed to assemble as fast as it can. So, as I said, it's knowing rates, uh, which is something, as I said, you're beginning to get some of these from molecular dynamics, uh, but it's still, it's a challenging problem, even for molecular dynamics, because in order to do it, you have to go get a free energy curve, right? And you need it in the two states, and then you need to have the methodology to do uh, calculator rates going back and forth, but it's all possible. You know, like for protein folding, they do it regularly now. They use these uh, Markov models, uh, like in the software from Frank Noah to, uh, to calculate uh, these rate constants. So there's certain problems where that is getting to be the standard. Right? In some processes, in some certain bioenergetic uh, mechanisms, even in like photosynthesis, they spent a lot of time uh, trying to get at these rates. Uh, and again, it's, uh, I'm not saying it's easy, right, <laughs> and, but it can be done, and, but in those cases, like when you go into photosynthesis, because it typically involves proton-electron transfer, you have to do a QM and M calculation, and I don't know, did you guys get any introduction to that, to this workshop? QMM? Mm -hmm. uh, we mentioned briefly. Right, so I think at the next uh, maybe next year's workshop. We we have the modules in development, and you can look at uh, reactions. So we'll probably have one where you can look at the charging of the tRNA. You know, how do you there are 20 amino acids? How do you find the right tRNA? How do you get the amino acid onto it? That can be those reactions can be simulated also in uh, in molecular dynamics through QMMM code. Those rates have been measured, so like right now we're sort of in that, you know how it goes. When you're doing the simulation, first you have to show that you can explain everything that's come before you. Then you can start making predictions, right? But, you know, we're sort of at the beginning process of just showing we can get, we can calculate things that make sense that have been measured experimentally. Happy? I have more questions, I'll ask later. <laughs> oh, that's, that's fine, I'm sure people want to hear it. <laughs> the question session should start now, so oh, I according to the program. Oh, okay. <laughs> I talk too fast. <laughs> so anything else? Any other questions, folks? Oh, okay. I just had a general question. I know you said it was sort of a additional lecture, but could you uh, say the last part of that again. You generalize the limitations of this method. You mentioned there were a lot of things that you can't do versus the big one. Yeah, so um, let's put it this way. You can use it to set up uh, you know, various hypotheses. Like, I think uh, like there are some proteins, you know, you know, well, let's take an example like the ribosomal protein. We say uh, it's built up to really have assembly work well. But should I allow those proteins to bind to the DNA as well or RNA? Should I allow, allow for non-specific interactions? So, yeah, well, you can say yes, but then it doesn't get into the model unless you put a rate constant for it. So, uh, and you can can do that. I, I would also say, uh, you know, Mike's working very diligently, but, you know, to be able to put in as many reactions as we needed. You know, when we did the ribosome biogenesis uh, the first time, we were really at the limit of our species that we could handle a number of reactions. That is becoming less and less of a problem. And um, to, again, clever programming on the GPU, improvements in the GPU, but you have to have a hypothesis. Right, and then assume a rate. Where, uh, so I, to me, that's sort of like you have to have an idea about a mechanism. What you learn from doing these 
is kinetically, if this is a fast process and that's a slow process, just in general, how is the cell going to respond? And right now, you know, it's difficult enough to even validate molecular dynamics or Brownian dynamics code simulations, right? You think of the experiments that are out there. Uh, the cell simulations, it's even harder. It's become somewhat easier because of the Nobel Prize that was given in 2014 for super resolution imaging. So uh, one of the noblest is on my list of collaborators, that's Murner, because he was able, I mean, they can track things in the cell. So you can see whether you've captured that process correctly. The validation is also uh, uh, a problem. But I, I think that's a problem for every population. How do you prove that you're wrong? So again, you know, I think the general picture, if you're doing molecular dynamics simulation and you can simulate it long enough, you might see changes in this in the system. That's very helpful for us because if it's obvious it's in two different confirmations, like if you do folding, it's folded and unfolded. Maybe it's a three-state folder. I don't know if I'd want to put that much detail in to folding in the cell, but at least you have to have two states, folded and unfolded. Yeah. But uh, as I said, uh, uh, non-specific interactions, you'll all, the only way I know how to handle that is by just assuming that they're there and adding more to that. The possibility. 